today I'm going to be chatting with Alex Hillkurtz about his book, Sketching Techniques for Artists. Alex Hilkertz was born in England and grew up in California, where he was an award-winning film student at Chapman University. And after graduating with a BA in film production, he established himself as a successful illustrator and storyboard, storyboard artist in Hollywood. And currently he's living in Paris and Alex has turned his focus to a career in, as a watercolor artist. And he's absolutely amazing. It's really fantastic. Alex, use, Alex uses the language of cinema to inform his images, moving beyond what is most obvious and focusing uh, on the viewer's eye on what he wants them to see. So that's really great, uh, really good information we're gonna be learning today. Um, Alex has exhibited his work in Europe, the United States, and Russia. He's a member of the National Watercolor Society in the U.S. and uh, the California Watercolor Association, and he's a member of the French Plein Air Painters and USK Urban Sketchers Paris. Uh, he conducts regular online and in-person workshops and master classes on watercolor painting and sketching. So let's bring Alex into the call. There he is. Hi, hello. Alex. Hello. Good, Good to, to see you. you. Bonjour. We should Bonjour. Talk. Yeah, <laughs> say at least say, say hello in French as you're in Paris right now in your studio. Yep. Uh, very good to see you. Good to be here. Bonjour. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's um, it's uh, it's good to be here. It's good to have everyone here. And uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to um, talk to people about and show people your images from your book, Sketching Techniques for Artists. So tell me about this book. How did it come together? And uh, when was it published? And where can people buy a copy? Thank you. You can buy this copy in uh, wherever books are found. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's in most bookshops. Uh, if it's not in your favorite local bookshop, uh, please ask them to order it. Um, and all sort of online Amazon, uh, you know, will will have it. Uh, this came about. I was contacted by Cordo Publishing. They're based in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, they reached out to me a couple of years ago, uh, maybe longer, um, and they uh, they have published a series of sketching books. They have one on uh, figure drawing and um, sort of specialized books, and they wanted me to do um, kind of this overall sketching techniques book and, and sort of showing off how I approach things and, and my style of watercolor painting as well. Um, so it was my, it's my first book. It was my first time working with a publisher, uh, and it, and it came out the beginning of last year. So it's been out for almost two years now. Okay. Well, yeah. it's, it's lovely. It's gorgeous. And at the end of our interview today, everyone, we're going to be doing a draw. I know that doesn't look like a lot, but it's, believe me, that took me an hour to cut out all these little <laughs> the paper. so we're going to be doing a draw for a free copy of this book at the end of our interview so exciting um so yeah why don't we uh get going and uh i'll share my screen and we'll turn our cameras off and then people can see images of your book okay okay there we go gorgeous oh my gosh alex really so gorgeous thank so you tell me about this sketch uh, this uh this is um you know this is paris i i live in paris uh and i am in love with the the streets the architecture these cafes i'm sure you know my my sort of red awning cafes uh this is very classic paris a very classic parisian scene um and i love uh, you know, the way that the sunlight and the shadows kind of move across the buildings throughout the day. Every hour, there's sort of a different mood to depict. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is... Very limited palette. Yeah, it is. And I, um, I'm relatively new to watercolor. There's sort of a longer history there, but um, 
I certainly understand the struggle that a lot of new artists have with, you know, kind of being overwhelmed with color and you don't really, you know, there's all these fancy names for pigments and it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, I come from sort of a sketching background, like a very, you know, pen and ink sort of black and white background. And so I would introduce colors very slowly, one at a time. Um, and Paris, I think for me is, is kind of the perfect subject because it is a very limited color palette city. There's, you know, a lot of shades of gray and then usually a pop of red or blue or sometimes yellow for these cafe awnings. So you can do kind of a, you know, a, a pencil sketch or a pen and ink sketch and then just add one color and it'll look really nice. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of what I did. And then I would introduce more and more colors. And, and you know, now I sort of, I'm much more comfortable with that and I can kind of do whatever. Um, but Paris, I think, uh, was definitely helpful when it came to this. And how long did you say you've been living in Paris? My wife and I have been here about nine years now. We moved okay. here about nine years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I had painted earlier when I was in university, uh, but I stopped for many years. I, I kind of, you know, had a whole career as a storyboard artist, um, sketching every day. And, and it's really been since I've lived here in Paris that I've picked up the paints again. Right. Um, so you can kind of trace this evolution of um, sort of larger pieces and more colorful pieces and maybe more expressive pieces um but it's it is always fun to kind of just go back to the sketchbook and and do something um sort of simple or or you know a little bit limited so tell me about your process um for creating a sketch like this one or do you start in with pencil first or... yeah i will typically start with a pencil sketch um I do this because, you know, I, I don't know if I dive in with paints or with ink, uh, you know, you can quickly sort of realize your proportions are off or your perspective is wrong or you're suddenly running out of paper in your sketchbook um, because you've, you know, your drawing wants to be bigger than the page. So I'll, I'll typically start with a pencil sketch, um, just pretty loose and pretty light yeah. just to get get the forms down, get, get everything, you know, where I feel I want it to be. And then I'll, um, uh, with this kind of a sketch, I, I reach for a, a pen, either a fine liner pen or a fountain pen mm -hmm. um, with some sort of waterproof ink okay. uh, and do so kind of a- It on before the, the paint. For me, it does. Yeah, I know, I know every artist is different, but for me, I've, I kind of ink a drawing in um, and again, keeping the ink very loose. Yeah. Uh, you know, some I found that with my style, the ink can get very, very heavy. If I, if I sort of focus on every little detail and every window and every banister railing, um, it can really get too heavy and kind of lifeless. So I, I like to keep the ink very loose um, and really um, kind of do a lot less than, than I think people would imagine. Um, you, I always say you can always add more detail uh, later, but you can't take it away. So, um, you know, if you feel like you've, if you feel like you've, you're putting too much ink on, just put your pen down, just move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I was thinking if you do pencil and then you do ink, probably when you finish the inking stage, uh, if it were me, I would look at it and go, wow, I think I'm done. This is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the trick. I, you know, again, I, you know, uh, because I come from this illustrator background, I think my early sketches would be very, very detailed. Um, and I'd really spend a lot of time on them. Um, but, uh, you know, I found that, like I said, they got a little heavy. And so, you know, over the years, I've really loosened up that inking style. And it's um, now it's hardly, I, I hardly touch the paper with a pen. You know, it's yeah. very, very faint. It's just sort of a few little um, touches here and there. Um, you know, and then I'll quit. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. 
No, I was going to say, and then I quickly sort of dive into to watercolor paint and, and start splashing paint around on the page. And that's where that's where it gets really fun for me. I am loving all the windows that are missing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I really feel especially like you look in any city, basically, um, there are thousands of windows. And I, um, I really find that less is more if you if you sort of touch a couple of windows, yeah, um, you know, the viewer's eye fills that in. You, yeah. You're not going to be confused. You know, you're not going to say, wait a minute, why aren't there, you know, 400 windows on the side of that building? It's like, no, it looks better when you leave a bunch out. Yeah. That's what, that's what I've found. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. So a couple of uh, questions here. Um, so Carol, Carol Ann is saying, uh, thanks for sharing your time and insights with us. Do you use hot press paper to save the nib of the fine liners? I don't, I use cold pressed. I, I really like rough paper. I like paper that has a bit of a tooth to it. Um, and that might seem counterintuitive because I use ink, but I sort of like the way it makes it less perfect. Um, when I sketch with a fountain pen, the pen will sort of skip across the page and it doesn't make a perfect line. And for me, this is more interesting. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, you know, if I wanted to make a really nice detailed ink sketch, yeah, I'd probably use uh, hot press paper, but I, I, I really like the, the feel. I love the texture. I love the tactile nature of all of it. So, um, yeah, I like I like kind of rough or, or sort of fine grained paper. So Diane is asking, what is the size of the original? Now that would be the last image that we looked at. And she says, I'm looking at the loose detailed bicycle racks and the railing and they're so appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That one, that one's pretty small. It's, um, I don't know, it's maybe 20 by 20 centimeters, which is, you know, what is that? I have no idea. <laughs> it's about, I don't know, eight, eight or 10 inches square. Yeah, it's not yeah. it's not very big yeah, yeah it's about eight inches i'm i'm looking at a ruler now yeah yeah cool and uh jenny is asking she says the gray tones are important are you using uh watercolor or ink for the building tones i'm using watercolor the uh if there's a little bit of warm tone on the building i, I usually use a raw sienna or um a yellow ochre uh, and then the grays, I mix all my grays with a combination of either ultramarine blue or cobalt blue and burnt sienna. Right. Um, that gets me a really nice even gray that I can that I can make either cool or warm, depending on the mix. And sometimes I'll put in a few other colors like that shadow in the center is a little bit on the lavender side. So I'll I'll drop in a little bit of um kind of rose or some sort of reddish color um just to just to vary those grays a little bit right okay and uh, martine is asking um do you have a fine liner preference and if so why that one i i don't i use i'm just looking behind me to see what i have um i use a lot of uh micron pigma micron um, pens um i also have a bunch of faber castell um i don't know i don't really have a favorite uh my true love is fountain pens <laughs> and i have way too many of those to count um so yeah i mean i kind of reach for whatever whatever tool at hand but i do i do prefer a very thin point so the the fine liners are like a zero one you know they're they're pretty thin and yeah. if they're if they're older and, and a little bit dry that's almost better you know then then they're even more scratchy and they've got oh. some personality <laughs> that's the opposite <laughs> of me i don't like scratchy at all <laughs> but that's okay that's great yeah so this sketch here this it, it, it seems to me that this buff color is about the color of most of the limestone buildings you see in europe and france and italy and so on yeah, this was, um, you know, I forget, I did this on a, I think it might be arches, like a cream colored paper. I think it's arches. 
Um, I have, again, I've a bunch of different kinds of paper that I use, but there is something nice about these, these sort of warm toned papers uh, that then um, that kind of works as, you know, your sunlight color of whatever you're sketching. And then you can add shadows with this, I think is with some graphite, water soluble graphite. Uh, and then I can even throw on some white um, pastel uh, that you see kind of there in the sky. And so, wow. you know, pretty quickly with just, uh, you know, basically two tools, two or three tools, you can get a lot of a pretty good range of values mm -hmm. um, and I don't know different colored papers are, are just kind of interesting to me you're not you're not always fighting this white which is which is fun yeah this is this is so beautiful really such a you have a really delicate touch to, with your paintings and uh, and I love that it's mixed media like this so fun um, so a couple of questions um, Berkay is asking, are you considering uh, to publish publishing an art book, meaning uh, not a lot of information, just the, the paintings? Just She says it would be nice to have all these paintings in one book. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got I've got a few ideas for uh, for another book. Um, I won't say too much about it because it's still very early stages, but um, but I'd love to. I'd love to publish a lot of my sketches and paintings and, um, you know, have those where people can really see them. Yeah. And George is asking, what colors would you recommend for a beginner to have in their watercolor palette as just uh, as being essential? Wow. Such a good question. I, um, you know, you can, there's, there's so many sets of watercolor paint, you know, you just go and get a, a little palette of 12 half pans or whatever it is. And they're usually a pretty good selection. Um, I think you need, you need, I don't know, a good way to think about it is you need a couple color, a couple different versions of each sort of color. So maybe two different blues, maybe two different reds, maybe a couple yellows. Um, you know, you can get pretty far with, with sort of those primaries. Yeah. Uh, and then you can, um, then you really start to learn how to mix colors together. Um, I think the, the danger is to run out and buy, you know, 72 colors or whatever it is. Yeah. And you, and you, you don't know, it just, it's overwhelming. It's too much information. Um, I really feel like color, you know, different pigments, they're almost like spices that you have in your kitchen. You can do a hell of a lot with sort of salt, pepper, <laughs> you know, cinnamon, <laughs> you can yeah. make a lot of interesting combinations and a lot of different dishes. And I, and it's, it's, you know, when you start out with a very limited palette, a, a limited number of colors, um, you really can figure out uh, how to use them and how much kind of mileage you can get out of each one. And what happens if I mix blue and brown? What happens if I mix, you know, red and, and yellow and, you know, where does that get you? And I would, I would recommend that. I would, you know, sort of choose maybe half a dozen colors. Yeah. You're thinking like a warm yellow and a cool yellow. A warm. Exactly. Red. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you might want a, a blue that's like a cobalt or an ultramarine, but then another blue that's maybe like a thalo blue, which has a lot of sort of green in it or something. Mm -hmm. um, so those are both kind of blue, but they're very different. Um, they're very different sort of personalities. And then you, the same thing with a, with a yellow, you're right. A very warm yellow and then kind of a cooler yellow. Um, uh, same thing with a red, you know, maybe a, a like a bright, vibrant fire truck red, and then maybe something that's more sort of a magenta y kind of rose color. Right. Um, yeah, and, and then and then maybe like an ultra, I mean, a burnt sienna that's kind of a, a rusty brown color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can really get far with yeah. with a selection like that. I think. Yeah. Especially when, like you, you're, you, there's only one color in this. <laughs> well, yeah, this was, again, yeah, this was, uh, this was Porto. Um, I was there, this was a number of years ago for the Urban Sketchers Symposium. Symposium, right. Yeah. Um, which was such a great event. Uh, 
And I find, I don't know if other artists are, are the same, but I find every time I go to a different city, I'm very kind of overwhelmed by the color palette. And it takes me a day or two to get my head around it. Yeah. Um, you know, this happened to me when I went to Venice for the first time. It, yeah. it was suddenly this explosion of color. And so my little trick for my own sanity is just to put all my colors away and just do a pen sketch, just do a black and white sketch. Um, this particular building happened to have this incredible yellow side to it that I thought was so great. And it just, I don't know, all I just wanted to do a pen and ink sketch and then, you know, slap on that yellow and that was enough. It really is this pop of color and it just makes for a super fun sketch, I think. Yeah. Um, rather than going in and, and painting every you know, door frame that's a different color. And, you know, I don't know, there's something about this one I kind of love. Yeah. So is, are the gray tones in here with uh, that water soluble graphite? These are, yes, I have. Um, yeah, I think I have, I think this was done with maybe like a watercolor pencil that's, that's uh, water soluble graphite. Okay. Um, so it's kind of, you, you just use it like a pencil and then you, you wet it with a clean brush, with a wet brush. Yeah. And it gives you this really interesting gray wash. Wow, it's so cool. It, you know, it's funny because the the your line work also reminds me a bit of KK. Do you know KK? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with his twig. Oh, my goodness. It, it's yeah. so loose, so <laughs> loose. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, and I think it's so fitting. Like, you know, this was my first time in Porto and so much of that city there's so much character and it can be like a lot of these older buildings look so shabby in this yeah. wonderful way yeah. and having a, a loose scratchy pen work um yeah. just absolutely works for that kind of um for that kind of structure yeah yeah i i uh i always sort of think of it as um like a grand dam you know grand dam who's who's older now and has fallen on hard times. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Cindy is, is saying, do you work, asking, do you work uh, more on individual sheets of paper or is it always in a sketchbook? I do both. I carry at least one sketchbook with me, often a couple um, that'll have different kinds of paper. And then I'll have loose sheets of watercolor paper. So um I can't remember what this particular one is in. This might be in a sketchbook, but um, yeah, I kind of I kind of mix it up. I have you know a bag that gets way too heavy because I've got you know fifty different kinds of paper in there. Yeah, yeah. A couple other questions, uh, Dale. Hi, Dale. Oh my gosh, long time no see. We, he traveled with me. I think uh, I think that was in San Antonio, uh, and he says I like the gray tones in your work. Do you always use watercolor, or do you use water-based markers such as a Tombow? I don't use markers. Um, I'll either use watercolor or, like, like I said, I'll use graphite, water-soluble graphite. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, Francine, hi, Francine, is asking, do you ever add the lights by using white paint, or is it always saved whites? Again, it's both. I like on that other sketch of on the toned paper, the white was pastel, white pastel. Um, I have a couple gel pens in my bag that I'm that I'm not afraid to use for for a couple little white highlights here and there. Okay. I've got I think I've got some white gouache in my palette that I, that occasionally I'll use. Um, and sometimes sometimes I'll save the white on the paper, just paint around it. Or I will always also use um, an X-Acto knife to scratch the paper sometimes to get back to a white. So there's, you know, it's kind of every trick in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you're allowed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've actually answered, uh, Borbala had, had the same question. I think you just answered it for her. Hmm. So um, Alex, I love Paris and I've been quite a few times. It didn't, you know, I never really thought about the red awnings before. Is, uh, is that like everywhere, red awnings? Is that something that stands out for you? Yes, they're everywhere. Uh, I had a friend a few years ago who lives in Italy and she came to Paris and she sort of was taking the bus through town and she's like, 
oh my God, it, it looks like Alex's paintings. Like she was amazed that on every corner, there's a cafe with a red awning and it is very like classic Parisian. Um, so yeah, you see them, you see them everywhere. And I, I happen to love them. I love the, I've always loved the color red. Uh, like we were saying earlier, it's often kind of this pop of color in an otherwise monochromatic scene. Um, the cafes are where all the life is, all the activity. So I don't know, I, I really love painting them. And it's fun because, I mean, it's fun for a lot of reasons, but it's fun because oftentimes I'll, I'll post one of my images and people will say, oh, I love this cafe. It's, you know, I've, I've been there. It's where I got engaged or it's, you know, it's around the corner from my hotel or whatever. And, and I'll say, well, I don't, maybe that's true, but there's so many of these cafes and, you know, a lot of them end up looking very similar. So um, yeah, there's, there's hundreds of them here in Paris. Yeah, you can almost do an amalgam. And I'm sure by now you um, are really familiar with the shapes and everything. You know, the, uh, the eyebrows over the window, one is a triangle, one's a half circle, one's a triangle, one's a half yes. circle, and so on. And the railings and everything, which I love all these things. So yeah, me too. There's so many details. Paris can be, Paris does have a uniformity about it. Um, a lot of the architecture is very similar, but there are, within that kind of similarity, there's so many details that are different from building to building to building, all the balconies, all the banister railings, all the details around the windows. It's, it's kind of endless and I, I really, I love it. I love this combination of this structure, but also this kind of wild variety that goes on. Mm -hmm. So this style of buildings, those are the houseman buildings, right? Yeah, these are the houseman buildings, which most of Paris looks like this. They're yeah, they're the all about downtown. Yeah, they're yeah, I mean all of central Paris. Yeah, yeah. inside the periphery. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're all about six stories tall. They've all um, you know, the roofs are similar, they've got those great chimneys. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then shops down on the on the ground ground level. Yeah, so yeah, so cool. Wow. Uh, so a couple of questions here. Mary, hi, Mary, is asking, uh, any tips for including sketchy people, figures? I think sketchy figures, like figures in a drawing. Yeah, people, adding figures to your drawing is, is such a great way to, to add scale and kind of some life energy. Um, and they can be tricky because we all know what people look like and if you do it wrong <laughs> it can look funny um I would recommend uh just taking sheets of paper and going somewhere where you can you can walk where you can people watch right. um and and maybe kind of far away not like um you know at a restaurant but like across the street at a bus stop or you know in a park or something where you can see people from a distance uh, and just sketch as fast as you can, as many figures as you can, just fill up that page, you know, draw 50 figures on a page and do it again and again and again. And you start to develop a shorthand um, for how to kind of capture a gesture of maybe a figure walking, maybe somebody carrying a heavy bag, maybe somebody pushing a stroller. Um, you know, what is, what is the silhouette of this person look like? Right. Um, you know, I, you know, it just takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of kind of, um, sort of attention to, to the gesture, uh, if that makes sense. Right. And are you suggesting people do that directly with watercolor? You can do, I, I would do it with a pen or a pencil if that's more comfortable, but you can absolutely do it with watercolor. If you're doing this kind of to get a gesture or a silhouette, you might just choose one color, just get like a fairly rich, you know, either a blue or a black or, you know, something that's like a, a good strong color and a, and a brush with a, a fairly fine point to it so that you can, you know, you can kind of blob in a shape of a torso, but then, you know, maybe the legs are a little bit thinner. Um, so yeah, I think that would be, 
you know, and always give people shadows. Always, uh, yeah. you know, if you if you sketch a lot of people, they can often feel unconnected to your piece until you give them a shadow. Right. So just, uh, you know, don't forget that. Yeah, cool. Very cool. And I think, uh, Alex, that you've answered Ginny's questions about including uh, figures in your sketch. So I'm going to skip that question, Ginny, but thank you for asking. And uh, someone else is saying, how far or near are you to your subject matter, thinking about perspective? Yeah, I think um, you got to find that kind of fine medium. If you're close if you're close up to a building, your perspective is going to be very, very distorted and it might be a real challenge. And if you're too far away, it might look a little too flat. Um, this is one of the train stations here in Paris. Uh, and, you know, I was just sort of sitting on a bench as all these thousands of people were swarming around me. I chose to not do any of them because I was more interested in the, the building itself. Um, but yeah, you kind of want, um, I don't know, I love to depict this like a strong sense of depth yeah. in an image. Um, and that usually comes about with linear perspective or atmospheric perspective if you're using paints as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I'm sketching a building, I'm usually just across the street, maybe on the opposite corner. Um, you know, it really, it depends. It's actually a fun exercise is to do the same subject from different perspective, different vantage points, um, you know, stand right up close to something and then move 50 feet away and then move 100 feet away and then, you know, just see how that affects your sketch or your painting. And, um, you know, each one of those is going to feel a little bit different. It's not that one is better or worse or right or wrong. It's just they're going to each one is going to feel slightly different and you might prefer one over the other you know yeah. what i mean a good exercise yeah um so um Burkay says uh, i realize that sometimes alex is using colors like a photographer in his paintings and mostly just painting the light other than shapes and mostly just painting the light other than shapes am i right i think you're right i think in some of my larger watercolor paintings I'm really in love with the light of, well, wherever I am, but, you know, particularly Paris, uh, the light and the shadow. And so once you start getting into that world, um, it can be fun to just paint maybe the shadow of a certain, the shadow details on a facade of a building. If there's a lot of, um, you know, balconies or, or sort of inset windows, if there's, you know, it's not a flat building but there's actually some details there um you know just to paint the shadows can really be an interesting thing because like yeah exactly thank you <laughs> um it can it can absolutely illustrate the building um without you getting hung up on too many details um and you feel the sunlight you know if you make your shadows really bold and dark the effect it has is making the painting seem brighter. Right. Um, it, it can be counterintuitive, but it makes that sunlight really shine. Right. So right. contrast. Yeah. 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 I. I. I, uh, I just. I just did a sketch myself uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, I. I did the same thing. Instead of worrying about this brick building, um, I painted the, the where the strong light was on it. I just left it white. And yeah. Just, painted the rest of it uh the shadowed part um because you know your eye fills in your eye knows that that's a brick building and yeah uh, and uh you don't need to paint every yeah yeah and I'll, I'll, figure I'll, out I'll all the shades right yeah yeah so i'll often do the sunlight colors first as a as a light wash um and the trick is to use a lot of water when it comes to that you really want that to be very pale and bright um if you get too heavy there you you kind of sunk a little bit so keep that nice and light use plenty of water and then once that's dry you come in and with a nice strong shadow and that's that's a pretty great combination yeah this is gorgeous um so is this is this the this is a different one from the one we saw previously it is yeah different different cafe 
Yeah. Okay. Well, they really do look a lot alike. <laughs> this is. Oh um, my gosh, Alex! I love extreme perspective. <laughs> yeah, this was in uh, Madrid, Spain. Um, I was just walking around, and I just looked up, and you know, it was on a on a circle, a traffic circle, and all the buildings were curved. But looking straight up, everything had this just incredibly dynamic perspective. And I just had to stop in my tracks and, and do this sketch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love I love this kind of thing. I love really extreme angles as well, either looking straight up at something or if you can get up high in a building and look down on the street, you know, it just we're so used to seeing things from eye level. Yeah. That uh, anytime we can sort of change it up it gets a little bit more dynamic oh yeah really interesting so this is in a sketchbook a squared off sketchbook and you've opened it up turned yes. it sideways and yeah so it spans two pages yeah kind of lay down on the sidewalk on your back and <laughs> no i was i was standing <laughs> i was standing and kept looking up and down at my sketchbook and back up at the buildings and it's yeah <laughs> I, I love it this is really fantastic is this in paris this is Madrid. Okay. Uh, it looks like um, uh, there's some buildings like that in Geneva uh, with mm. their homes. So it's wonderful. Mm. Gorgeous, mm. really gorgeous. Thank okay, you. Okay, a few Thank more questions. Um, Carol Lamb says the structure of the building seems to create location. Do you use the brushwork to create the tension and feeling of movement of each piece? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I paint a lot of architecture. And, you know, you would think that these are sort of static objects, they don't move. Um, but the trick is to portray uh, kind of movement or portray personality. Um, and so I think you can do this with, with your brush strokes. Um, if you're painting a very tall building, you might want to use sort of vertical brush strokes, uh, whereas, if you're doing the street at the bottom of your page, you might want to do very horizontal brush strokes. Um, so that's kind of the basic difference. You know, the the way you lay your paint on your page um, kind of tells you uh, which way things are moving, um, and shadows uh, make that all more interesting. You know, sometimes shadows creep across a, a street horizontally, and then they climb a facade of a building vertically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of, you change the angle of your brush strokes to, to mimic this. Uh, and it's one of those things that can really add movement to, to a painting. Yeah. Wow. I, I think it's, I think there's some real value to these interviews that I do with people because there is some value to taking time to really look at a, an artist's um, work uh, one after another, after another, and to absorb you know, the techniques that they're using and really stare at the, that art intently. I think you yeah. can learn a lot by looking at other other artists' uh, work. Absolutely. Them. Yeah, I do this all the time. I'm always inspired by other artists. Um, you know, I'm sort of spoiled for riches here in Paris, going yes, to so are. many different museums and seeing classic art. And you really, yeah, you that's that's the best school. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Um, so um, just a question, Alex, are you, uh, is, did you include in these um, images for me uh, a painting of corks? Oh, no, I might not have. I don't think I did. Okay. Uh, Shoot, because there's a question about that. So we can maybe sh hold the sketchbook up and show your painting of corks. Uh, uh, it's in the book, and I couldn't remember if, I, if it was also one of the uh, images that you sent me but um so we have a question about that painting of corks uh, it's by Anne Anna Marielle who's who asks she says I love your painting with the corks I think it's amazing uh how long did it take you to paint that and how does it usually take how long does it usually take you to finish a painting so why don't we hold off on that question till the end and I'll hold up the image so that people can know what we're talking about Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, so Elizabeth is asking, hi, Elizabeth, when you use fountain pens, would you use food a nibs to give you an additional dimension? Yeah, I have. I have one of those pens. Um, and yeah, you can absolutely, you know, that's a pretty interesting, versatile nib. You can get a lot of variety out of that. So 
um, yeah, that's definitely one that I have in my bag. And so do you have a preferred brand of fountain pen and size and type of nibs? Paul is asking. I, um, I sort of go from favorite to favorite. My, my favorite for many years was a Faber-Castell guilloche fountain pen with a, with a fine nib, an F nib. Uh, that's an expensive pen. I don't, I don't sort of recommend that lightly because I, I found that in a very particular way. I went to, I happened to be in Los Angeles at the time and I, there's a great pen store in Westwood that I would go to. And I went in there and I, and I had some of my watercolor paper and I said, I explained what I did. I said, I'm not into, you know, writing fancy calligraphy or wedding invitations. I'm a sketcher and an artist. And I use kind of rough paper and this is what I want to do. And, and they just sort of laid out all these different pens on the counter for me to try. Um, they were very patient with me. And I, you quickly find what feels good, what doesn't, what fits in your hand, what feels a little too heavy. Uh, it's a very personal decision. Um, so I, I, I found my uh, Faber-Castell that way. It just worked for me. Um, I found a sailor pen that I really liked that, that was also very nice. Um, and then since then I've sort of, um, I've gotten a couple um, vintage fountain pens, antique fountain pens that are surprisingly great. So it's very, I'm reluctant to recommend specific things because it's such a personal um, tool. Um, I think with fountain pens, you do get what you pay for. Uh, you can certainly get a $20 pen, um, but it's gonna, you know, it's not gonna be much better than a fine liner uh, felt pen, honestly. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you, you start to spend a little bit more money um, and, and the nib is where the money is. Um, if, you're, if you're using a cheaper pen, like a less expensive pen, the nib is probably made out of steel which is less flexible. So it's gonna be a very kind of, um, kind of hard experience writing with it. Um, if you spend a lot of money, you get a, a nib that's made out of gold <laughs> or platinum, and that's very flexible and that'll give you a lot of variety within your line. So, you know, um, there's certainly a whole wor world to explore with fountain pens. Um, but uh, but it, it's pretty fun. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this, this uh, sketch here, I'm looking at, I'm thinking, wow, he's using all the tricks in the book here. So I see some splattering. Do I? Some little spritzing? Yeah, this is, this is kind of a larger watercolor painting. Uh, this is a cafe that's kind of in my neighborhood here in Paris. Uh, it used to be an old bookstore. It used to be an antique bookshop. Um, and it was in the last few years um, turned into this cafe, but they've kept the facade, which looks so great. Um, so yeah, I, this is, there's a lot of, there's sort of wet on wet, there's some dry brush, there's some, like you said, there's some splattering of water, there's some splattering of color, um, there's ink. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, I was sort of throwing everything at this one that I could. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. There, and real yeah, economy of line as well. Yeah, you know, I really wanted to concentrate all the details on that cafe. Um, yeah. You know, it's that's where that's where sort of the highest contrast is with light and shadow. Um, the most colors are. Uh, so everything else, um, I can afford to to keep a little loose. You know, those those windows in the upper right hand corner. You know, they're barely there, but it doesn't matter because they're. Yeah. Um, you know, you fill it in and, and the, the information sort of down the street to the left, um, you know, that's far away. And so I can afford to, to have that be, the colors are a little more muted. Uh, there's less detail. Uh, it just feels far away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Cool. yeah. So cool. I love it. Really. I, yeah. Thank you. This was a fun one to do. I like that. All right. There we go. Wow. <laughs> this is a, this so is different. a sketch. Yeah, so different. Yeah, this is a sketch, kind of a quick, 
a watercolor sketch in Switzerland. Um, I was there a number of years ago and I just, you know, I mean, you just, you're in the Alps. It's incredible. There's these little chalets and these, um, I, I really love the atmospheric perspective of these mountains. I love the distance of those blue mountains. Mm -hmm. And then as you get closer and closer up the valley, things are green and then much more sort of almost yellow in the foreground and bright, darker greens. And then the all contrasted with this rusty red roof of this little house and these deep kind of almost blue shadows. I just, I really wanted to play with all those colors. Yeah. Um, and it's a pretty quick, you know, I was sort of sitting on this little bench, I don't know, 45 minutes. It's pretty, pretty quick. Yeah. Just a, a nice little memory of an afternoon up there. And do you have a favorite European city? Someone is asking Alex. Do I have a favorite European city? Yep. Uh, well, I, you know, I got to say Paris. Um, I don't know. Florence. That inspires you the most. Yeah, I think Paris has got to be the answer. <laughs> That's sort of what inspires me the most. Um, uh, partly because I live here and I walk around every day and I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly inspired by, you know, every street corner is interesting. The parks are gorgeous as the seasons come and go. Um, but yeah, I love, I mean, Venice is spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I was in Prague earlier this year. That was amazing um Amsterdam yeah it's London uh, you know every city has such a unique personality that it's yeah. it's really really so fun to to be able to hop around well great for you that you're living in the one you like the most so <laughs> right that works out <laughs> yeah that works lucky for you I love the um I love the shadow on the from the rooftops of these buildings my goodness like stairs going down that's fantastic yeah, this is Lucca, Italy, yeah. uh, in Tuscany. I was there in August, and this is a this is the central square of that town, which is actually an oval. It's a, a circular um, sort of town square, um, and so you get these really interesting shadows that are kind of curving, and as the sun moves, they keep getting longer. And um, I, I don't know. It's a it's a super fun. Yeah. And all the roofs, because it's Italy, all the, the roofs kind of hang overhang the buildings a little bit. So you do get these these really um, long shadows that sort of creep down the facade of the of each building. Yeah, uh, this is super great, super fun. I really love it. Thanks. OK, so uh, is that an accidental coffee ring or? <laughs> <laughs> No, this is very much intentional. Um, oh. I started doing this years ago. I, you know, I'm not the first person to do this, but it has become a bit of a signature for me. I end up sketching in cafes quite a bit, or I, or I'm doing sketches of cafes. And so I'm, you know, I'm at a little table. I've got my sketchbook. I've got my paints. I've got a a little espresso. Um, it just for me, it's kind of a natural part of the experience to include the flavor and the smell of coffee in the flavor and the texture um, and the colors of all the paints. So I would, I would start to, you know, if I had a coffee there, I would just make a little stamp, uh, you know, put it in the saucer and yeah. push it onto my page. Um, so it's really kind of become almost a signature for me now. I have it on my business cards. Oh, that's um, great. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't get onto every painting, but you know, if I've done a, a a painting of a cafe, sometimes it's like, well, it's missing something, and coffee is often the the answer. <laughs> that's great. And if you run out of brown paint, you can always paint with the coffee. You can paint with coffee. I've got a friend here in Paris who paints with coffee and, and she does some pretty spectacular things. Yeah, it's fun. It can be wow. fun. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's great. So do you think of yourself as a, as a, a watercolor, uh, a water a watercolorist or more of a sketcher, urban sketcher, or how, how do you define yourself? I say I'm a watercolor artist. I, um, I know everyone likes to pigeonhole everyone. Um, and I, you know, I do sketching, I do urban sketching. I'm, I'm, I've done a lot with urban sketchers here in Paris and other cities. 
I've done plein air painting. You know, I, I, for me, it's all a continuum and I do it all. Um, but I, you know, I sort of, for me, it's watercolor artist or watercolor painter is kind of the blanket term. Um, so yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I love the, uh, how granular the paint is uh, on this, on this one. Yeah, this is, um, this is a combination of the paper and the pigments. Um, it's a handmade paper from a paper mill here in France oh. that's super, um, very high grain uh, and, and also very soft. So as soon as I started painting, the, the paint would start to separate in these really interesting ways. Um, and I kind of love it because it just takes on the texture of the building. It's, you know, the paint does so much work for you. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have to, I tell, you know, when I give workshops, I tell students a lot, don't, you don't have to concentrate on every little detail or every little texture. The, the paint and the paper can do so much work for you. They, there can be so much dynamic kind of variety in the texture of how you apply the paint. Um, that it can, it can do magical things, sometimes that you don't intend, uh, but it ends up making a piece really come to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's beautiful. I love this one, so nice. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, another red awning, different, different cafe. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I'm gonna again, pay I... more attention to the red awnings next time I'm in Paris. I had next time you're here, you'll see. Yeah, next time you're here, you'll you'll see them everywhere. Yeah, um, it is funny because I um, I had an exhibit uh, last year in Paris, and I had a lot of my sort of red awning <laughs> paintings. And some people, some locals, would come in and they'd be like, "Oh, you've captured Paris perfectly." And other people would say, "What's with the red? I don't get it." <laughs> so it's you know it's funny. Even people who live here in Paris sometimes you're blind to. Uh, your own city, you know? I'm going to pay more attention next time. Um, I remember in June I was there and uh, I remember having lunch at uh, Flo Flore. What, Flore, I think it's called. Cafe de Flore. Yeah. Cafe de Flore. They have a white green. Yeah. They have, I think it's white, maybe some green. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those, yeah, you're right. Those cafes, okay, they're different. But yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, okay. there's, a, there's plenty of red around. <laughs> I'm going to pay more attention. I remember um, also we had our farewell dinner. It was at the, um, uh, the Chien Qui Fume. Uh, okay. The smoking, okay. The smoking dog. <laughs> okay. All right. I remember yeah. that, but I don't remember. Really. I'm going to pay more attention next time. I love yeah. that you included this up here in this top right corner, the underside of the awning from where you were standing. Exactly. Yeah. You know, sometimes, I, I don't know, it's just, it's a nice touch to, to include sometimes a foreground element if there's a tree yeah. or an overhanging cafe or a bicycle or something, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that in a painting, it, it really adds an extra dimension of depth. Yeah, it is very, really, really cool. I love it. it looks like it's always raining in Paris. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, well, the reflections always look cool. So they yeah. do. Yeah. Tell me about this one. This I think this is sort of stages of a painting. I'm not sure. But this is like, you know, kind of early sort of an ink, um, ink sketch. Uh, so you can see, you know, kind of the level of detail or the, the lack of detail that I'll put into just the ink sketch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I'll move on to paint. Yeah, you can, I mean, I, it's, I, I don't know that people would necessarily know it's Paris, but definitely European. Yeah, it's, it's got this old world kind of feel, this, you know, detailed buildings with, you know, an interesting roof line. And, yeah, you know, I think that yeah. roof line is called a mansard roof. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah and then this is um, kind of zoomed out on the same image, but this is, you know, kind of a first wash of color. I'll do a lot of wet on wet so there's some raw sienna in the center you know some sort of a, maybe a cobalt around the outside and then um the red at the bottom and it's all you know the whole page is wet at this point so these colors are blending together and mixing on the page and and getting a real soft um kind of blend of color 
and so separating I'll typically, as well. Yeah, so being a little granulating. Um, so I'll, I'll typically do that and then let that completely dry. Uh, and then the next stage, and then do the next stage. Um, yeah, I think actually this I did, the paper was still a little bit wet, a little bit damp. So I did some roof color, a darker shade for the roof and, and more red for the, for the, where the awning is. But the, I think the paper was still pretty damp at this point. So it, it gives a soft edge to everything. Mm -hmm. Things aren't very defined at this point. Yeah. And now, uh, you know, once the paper is dry, I can come in and do, you know, very um, strong shadows and and darker details around these windows where the sh where the shadow is is in the window frames and underneath the balconies, um, darker under the cafe, kind of the street, um, the gray of the streets. Uh, so then it that really starts to come into focus. So this is these are kind of the steps of how I approach. Um, a, a scene like this. Right, right. Or do you use, uh, I just want to go back for a sec, do you, do you use some um, salt? You know, I don't. I, um, I use a few kind of special effects, splattering paint and, uh, and other things. I haven't really used salt. Um, I don't, I, I think it's sort of, I don't know, for my style, I could use it maybe very sparingly, a little bit. Salt, if you don't know, it's, um, you can sort of sprinkle some salt onto uh, wet paper, uh, like a wet wash of color, and it sort of sucks up some of that color. And then when it dries, you brush the salt away and you're left with these interesting kind of almost snowflake yeah. um, splatters. Um, it can be, because the salt sucks up a lot of the water. Um, I was thinking maybe that's what happened in here. No, I that's sort of flicking clean water. Oh uh, wow! And it does a it does a similar thing, but kind of less. Um, I don't know. It's just a sort of a softer version of that. Right. This was um, this this is an image from the book, uh, and I was I was thinking a lot about composition and what makes an interesting painting and what doesn't, and I was thinking. Um, about the angles of all these streets here in Paris. Uh, yeah. A lot of European cities are, are, very, are similar because um, these cities kind of grew up before the advent of cars. Uh, um, so all these angles are so interesting and, and some angles are sharper than others. And I found that for me, from the kinds of things that I like to sketch and paint, the sharp angles make for better paintings. Um, so I'll look for, oftentimes I can look at a map of a city and I can, I can say, you know what, I think this intersection might have something interesting, having never been there before. Yeah. Um, or you can say, you know what, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go to this part of town because maybe it, it, it's on a grid or, you know, it looks a little less dynamic. Um, so that was, that was this little blurb in the book that I was kind of explaining my thought process behind some of this. Cool. Uh, yeah, and then I sort of took I took it a little further, and you know, some of these angles are are very sharp. Um, some are kind of spread out and shallow. Um, yeah. So and, you know, when you don't have those forty five degree angle, I mean ninety degree angles on buildings, um, then you're really having you. It's it's not it's not for the beginner because you really have to pay attention to and draw what you see because the perspective is going to be trickier yeah the perspective can be um kind of more extreme um so yeah you're right you, yeah when you're, you're out there yeah you really gotta um you know it's good to know sort of some basic principles of perspective yeah um but you really you're right it's really about perception and and kind of seeing you know looking closely at what you're seeing and and then trying to depict that on your page it can be hard but um this was a this was kind of in the same chapter in my book i was talking about how paris um kind of grew up and evolved over the centuries like many of these old cities um it sort of started you know thousands of years ago with maybe dirt tracks and, and a, a small farming village and then became um something a little bit more um 
populated and then um, you know eventually to the to the city we know today and so I kind of I did this illustration to sort of show that like you know um, this these histories of maps that sometimes the streets and the avenues that we're walking down are actually there because you know 700 years ago that was where you know the farmer walked their cows to the field or whatever you know it was it's um you know sort of this ancient memory uh of these old 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 maps and it and it's you still feel the the traces of that in a in the city you walk around today so that's what i was playing with here yeah and i mean it it impacts you're absolutely right it's be, these cities that were built up before the um the advent of cars um are more likely to have been originally just like a deer trail or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. you go back far enough and it's really a little village, um, you know, with some trails and then, yeah, so. Yeah, very cool. This this is one that um, I, I'm sure a lot of people recognize. I, uh, this, I did this a few years ago. This is actually a view from my apartment. Um, I live on the top floor, so I can look down on this cafe. Uh, and I love this extreme angle, looking down on something. But also this kind of shows, you know, this is sort of one of those pointy buildings. It's sort of thrusting itself out into the intersection. Um, and so you kind of combine this, this interesting perspective, uh, this interesting shape of the the building coming out into the intersection, um, you know, this this really kind of hard side light, sunlight and shadow, and it just makes for a really kind of dynamic image. Um, and then you throw in the, the red, um, you know, a primarily monochromatic scene, but with this pop of vibrant red, um, it's just kind of a, a great combination. And I sort of, I'm, I'm in love with this <laughs> this uh this combination yeah um, well so, yeah. i mean if you love it and it's so uh if you love it you should keep doing it because uh, <laughs> it's your thing so that's great yeah um sorry i'm missing quite a few uh questions here that i didn't realize they were kind of below the screen so i want to go through some questions quickly um and so dale is asking hi dale brother of dawn <laughs> do you do the entire piece all of, uh, all of the mediums at the site or do you finish in the studio I do a little bit of both. Um, there's, I usually do at least a little bit back at home. I, it, it is really nice to do a, a whole piece on site, like a plein air sketch or a plein air painting. Um, if I'm doing a larger painting, um, there's usually something that I'll bring home to a studio and kind of finish up. Um, right. But yes, for smaller sketches in a sketchbook, those are all done on site and there's there's something that's so great about just the immediacy of of you know spending however long you have um just sort of capturing a moment um you know and that's that's what it is yeah uh, there's there's a great energy and life to that yeah and so i think you probably just answered the question for cc who asked do you take pictures of your su subjects and work from them I do that as well. Again, if I'm doing a larger painting, I just finished last week, I just finished my biggest painting yet, which was a challenge just because of the scale. Um, and that I did from photo reference, just because, you know, it would just be unwieldy to have this massive thing out on the street. And probably get um, blown away. <laughs> it would get blown away and people would get mad at me for taking up half the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, if I'm in a park or if I'm, you know, somewhere where I where I've got a lot of space, it can be nice to work on a nice big sheet of paper and do a do a big painting. But um, often with especially larger pieces, I'll I'll use photo reference. But uh, you know, I'll also I'll know the subject well. I'll have done sort of other sketches diff of different times of day and I'll have photos. So it's, you know, it's kind of all of the above. This, again, this was um, a little lesson in the book where I talk about the rule of thirds. I talk about composition. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know this sort of rule of thirds. Uh, it's not the only way to compose an image, but it can be a very um, dynamic um, way 
And this is the idea that you divide your page into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. And then you'll have four uh, places where those lines will intersect. And if you put your subject, your center of focus on one of those intersections, you'll have uh, a pretty interesting composition, a more dynamic composition. Um, and this is just a way to, there are certainly other ways to compose images. Um, this is one of many, but this is a way, this is a nice kind of asymmetrical um, composition. Um, so rather than having your center of focus sort of dead center, um, just place it off center a little bit. Um, and it can make it can make an image a little bit more dynamic. As you're looking at it, your your eye tends to move around the space uh, in a in an interesting way, and you keep sort of coming back to the cafe. You maybe look up at the tree. You come down to the person or the people on the lower left. You come back to the cafe again. Your eye keeps kind of moving around in a nice a nice way. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what this is was kind of illustrating. So we're going to squeeze every last bit of information out of you, Alex, before the end of <laughs> this interview. Um, so Paul, oh, sorry, I'm having a, a fire department, uh, fire truck going by. Um, Paul wants to know, do you use an, a mouth atomizer for the fine spat spattering of textures? No, but that's, I think I have one. of. Uh, what is that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't use one. You know, I use an old tooth. I use an old toothbrush. That's okay. what I use. Yeah. Um, I do have. I think I didn't know actually what it was called, but I think I know what you're talking about. And I do have something that sounds like it fits that description. Oh. Um, but I don't. I don't use it that much. But yeah, um, either an old toothbrush or just kind of flicking paint from a from a brush, like right. tapping. Yeah. So this sketch that we're looking at here, this is paint on first, and then pen afterwards. Well, this is um, this is a thumbnail sketch, uh, and this is another kind of lesson that I teach to students um, to do a a very quick and dirty version of your subject before you dive into a larger painting. Um, and this is done with with an ink pen uh, and water soluble graphite. And it's done on brown paper, just really cheap kind of newsprint paper. Um, and it's a, you know, and this is small. This is like, you know, three by four inches. It's a small little thing. And you can do this in maybe five minutes, certainly less than 10 minutes. Um, and uh, this is a nice exercise to do. Um, it's almost like a dress rehearsal for a for a more finished painting. You can you can spend five minutes and you know figure out perspective, figure out light and shadow, figure out composition. And if you don't like it, um, you've only spent five minutes, and so you can move somewhere else. Uh, you know, get closer, get further away, um, change your vantage point, and do it again. Um, you know, this this is a nice. It's a nice thing to do that um, just kind of get, gets you warmed up um, um, and sort of teaches you a lot about your subject before you dive into something bigger. Um, so that's, that's what this is. Uh, and then I think the next slide is probably the finished painting. Yeah, this is, this is the painting that I did. That, and this is a little bit larger. So this is, I don't know, 12 by 15 or 12, you know, inches maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit bigger, um, you know, and so now I've, I already know the perspective, I know my composition, so I know where my subject is going to sit on my page, so I'm not going to run out of paper if I sketch too large, um, I kind of, I know where the light and shadow is going to be, um, you know, the sun tends to move or clouds appear, uh, but because I've done that preparatory sketch, um, I've kind of frozen that moment in time. So if my subject changes, if the light changes, or if, you know, a garbage truck parks in front of me and I can't see it anymore or, or whatever, um, I do have that preparatory sketch that I can refer to. Um, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the process that I was showing here. 
Okay. I want to catch up on some of the questions by our viewers. Um, so uh, someone is asking, what drawing exercises or homework do you suggest uh, for your students in order to be become a better draw drawer? You know, I think it really, it depends on what you are wanting to do and it depends what you feel you're weakest at. Um, I know a lot of people struggle with perspective. Um, so I think that's something to practice to become, so it becomes really second nature. Um, earlier, somebody had a question about figures. I think um, drawing people uh, is something that also people have people can struggle with or you want to get more proficient at. So that's something to, to practice at. Um, I don't know, you know, it really, it depends on each artist. I know I went through a stage where I realized I wasn't very good at trees. <laughs> and so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give myself homework and I'm just going to draw and paint trees. Um, you know, kind of study the shapes and how the light falls and, you know, because there is sort of a an anatomy to to a tree and if if it looks weird it's you know you just want it to look somewhat realistic or somewhat interesting They're believable um, yeah believable exactly and so yeah. i think you know if you you know maybe look at your own work if there's something that you think you're less good at like oh maybe you know i'm not very good at this particular color mixture or maybe light is shadows are my weak weakness or you know whatever it is i think um you know, you're probably the best judge of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, Burkay says, um, do you think uh, it's possible to become a professional artist without studying art, at least in the beginning, because schools are so expensive? So uh, they said, I'm using, so I'm using cheaper materials to learn, such as domestic ed courses or the internet. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the way to go. Um, I did not go to art school. Um, I, I don't know, the, the term self-taught is thrown around a lot, but there's so many places to, to learn from teachers that, that I don't, you know, being self-taught is sort of <laughs> not <laughs> accurate. Um, right. Well, you're not yeah. learning within a vacuum, right? Like you're yeah, learning exactly. from other there's, people. Yeah, you've, you've got a million teachers. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Domestica. Um, I think there's some pretty incredible courses on that and, and on Domestica and other platforms. Um, like Studio 56 Boutique. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Well done. Um, yeah, no kidding. There's um, some incredible talent uh, demonstrating their work. And this is, um, you know, I, I, I think we're kind of in this golden age where we do have access to a lot of professional artists who are willing to share their techniques. Um, this was not always the case. Uh, or you had to, you know, go to a prestigious school um, to, to sort of get that, um, or an atelier or something. So yeah, I think um, wherever you can learn from is valuable. Uh, books, the internet, YouTube, um, you know, online courses, in-person workshops. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of choices out there. Um, so you, and and you can absolutely become a professional if that's your goal. Okay. Is do you have a comment about this image? And sorry that it flashed there. It suddenly. Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, again, this is an image from the book. Um, I, I'm sort of demonstrating um, watercolor techniques and um, you know how to sort of lay down different types of washes of color. Um, so this is just show, this is just demonstrating that kind of wetting the page and, and seeing the the sheen of light on the page so you can tell that it's wet right cool and yeah this one? i don't see it i see oh, the same really you're not seeing a, a a different drawing no i'm still seeing the paintbrush on a did my thing freeze oh, well, <laughs> i can still hear uh, you yeah Hmm, that is really weird. All right, let me see. All right, thanks for your patience, everyone, while we deal with tech issues. Uh, let's just <laughs> see what's happening here. Um, I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to start the share again. There, now do you see, what do you see now? 
Yes. So this is uh, kind of a sketch of cubes and cylinders and things. Okay. Um, yeah, this was this is another image from the book. And I talk about, you know, oftentimes sketching architecture in particular, it can be very overwhelming with all the details. People, people kind of fixate on details. Um, and I think uh, a, a better way to approach architecture is to break things down into large, simple shapes. Um, so you can think about it in, you know, this is a box, this is a cube, maybe there's a cylinder, maybe there's a dome on top. Um, it's very basic, simple shapes that then you can um, add details to um, and kind of get more and more um, precise about things. But it, but it begins with these, with being able to, to sort of recognize and depict the large, simple shapes of a structure. Yeah, I think your book is, I mean, it's called Sketching Techniques for Artists, and it really does cover a lot of the basics. And I'm just looking at the table of contents, and you're talking about a lot, uh, chapter on materials and tools, general sketching techniques, composition, perspective, still life, landscapes, architecture, figures, and watercolor. So, I mean, you really are covering quite a lot in this book. Yeah, it really, it, it does kind of cover all bases. Um, working with this publisher, they really wanted a, a book that was pretty comprehensive. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was nice to kind of dive in to things that I'm, uh, I certainly do, but I don't make them my practice like still life. Um, but I can talk about that. Uh, I do a lot of figure drawing. It's not necessarily what I post on my Instagram, but um, I certainly have done a lot of that. Um, but yeah, this is this image is kind of carrying on that idea of um, once you have sort of those larger shapes, you know, maybe that was a big cube shape, you can then um, complicate it and um, and make it more interesting with by adding details, you know, this arched window frame or these sort of cut out shapes on the corners. Um, so it's a process of starting with the big shapes and, and working your way down to the details. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm trying to, to get through all these, oops, trying to get through all these uh, uh, questions, but I don't think I'm having a feeling we're not going to get through all the questions. And that's all <laughs> yeah, I'm, this is, again, this is the same, the same thing I was just saying. Um, breaking it know, down. Exactly. Get it. Yeah. Break it down, get it, add details slowly and, and, you know, yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and this is, um, uh, you know, this is kind of putting all of those pieces together. There's um, there's linear perspective here. There's atmospheric perspective. As the as the street gets away from us on the right hand side, it gets less detailed, and the colors are more muted. Mm -hmm. um, there's light and shadow. There's texture. There's there's details. You know, it's kind of this is sort of combining all those um, all those different things that we've talked about into one image. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful, gorgeous. I love this. Thank sketch. you. Thank you. Oh, and is this one? I is there twice? Feel like we're back at the beginning. <laughs> okay, I think I think we are. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, we can turn our cameras back on. Um, all righty. There we go. Thank you so much for that. You're, you're very welcome. That's it's fun to it's fun to kind of talk about this and sort of show off some images and um, yeah. Well, yeah. isn't our it our favorite topic of conversation, really? Right, right. Yeah. We could just we could talk about art and painting and sketching all day. So totally. I, I <laughs> wish you know more of my close friends were artists because I don't often get, I only get a chance to talk about art when I'm with other artists and uh, yeah. <laughs> I love to talk about art. Um, so uh, your book is Sketching Techniques for Artists and it can be ordered online, uh, Amazon or anywhere. Yeah, anywhere, um, anywhere you get books. Uh, Waterstones in the Court? UK. Sorry? The publisher is Rockport? Yes, um, yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you can, if you, if you Google it, you Google my name or the name of the book, you'll find it. Yeah. And I want to just show this uh, 
sketch of corks that somebody was admiring so much. And I yeah. wanted to know how long did it take you to paint that? You know, it took a while. I've done it a couple different times. I, I have I have one here that is um, that's in a sketchbook. Um, this was this was sort of a, a trial that I did, and that you know it took I don't know an hour or two. I don't know, um, but I I really wanted to do a larger piece, uh, and I I really was playing with. Um, my friend Brenda Swenson, um, who you may know, uh, does this, she does a lot of um, botanical um, flower paintings um, and she uses this technique of kind of negative painting. And I loved, I love her, that technique, but I wanted to do my own subject using some of those techniques. And so I wanted to lay down all these washes of color and then come back in and do um, sort of the shadows and the, the negative space around all the corks. Um, cool. And that larger one, um, I don't know, it, it probably took a couple of days. Wow. Uh, uh, I sort of, I'm not, I mean, I can paint fast, but sometimes when I'm doing a new subject uh, or, a, or a technique that I'm less familiar with, I'll, I'll do one stage and I'll, I'll kind of let it sit overnight and come back to it the next day and think, okay, how do I want to proceed? Um, and I'll, I'll do a little bit more and I'll kind of be a little bit more methodical about it. Um, yeah, so that was, that was the corks painting. Well, that's great. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. I've got a few announcements to make and then we are going to do our draw for this. <laughs> so exciting. So. So we're super excited to announce that we have just launched a new vacation workshop in the Hilltop Villages of Provence taught by our very own Alex Hilkertz and that will take place in April 22 to 26, 2024 and uh, we just launched it. We have lots of tickets available and we're going to have a fabulous time uh, exploring Avignon and Gord and Minerve and Roussillon and um, Saint Rami and uh, Aix en Provence and Bonnieu. And it's going to be a fabulous uh, vacation workshop. We're going to follow in the footsteps of Cezanne and Van Gogh. Alex is going to teach five fabulous watercolor workshops and it's going to be super fun. And if you're interested, tickets are available and you'll find the link in the description of this uh, interview. Also, Hazel Sohn will be teaching a workshop in Florence in September. Tickets still available. Pat Southern Pierce is going to be in Niagara on the Lake in September. Tickets still available. Uh, Kosha Kona, the co-founder of Sketchbook School, is going to be teaching a workshop in Malta in November. I'm really excited about that. And uh, also, finally, I've just launched a new series of weekly sketching tutorials myself called Feed Your Creative Soul, and I'm super excited. And we're going to have a lot of fun sketching together and learning new tips and tricks every week. So you can find out about that from the website. And uh, so finally, let's do our book draw, shall we? So thank you, everybody, for coming to the interview. And uh, we're going to do this draw. And you're mailing the book. Is that right, Alex? I will mail the book and I will sign it for the winner. So if okay. this will be a personalized copy for whoever's whoever's name comes out of the jar. The moment okay. we've all been waiting. <laughs> all right, so that you can see nothing up my sleeve. Wait, I better show you. Nothing up my sleeve. <laughs> all right, so I'm just gonna pull a slip of paper out of here. If I can grab Good luck, it. everyone. Okay, and whoops, and the winner is uh oh my goodness it's a i can't it's um a name that's not in english it's got symbols i can't read it so it looks like it's anna copa something so it looks i think it's greek greek symbols in this name <laughs> and the and the uh order number is 10101 so i'll show you what it says uh, i can't read that because I don't speak that language. All right. <laughs> well, I think it's Anna. I think it's probably pronounced Anna. Anna. Uh, congratulations. We'll yeah, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll be in touch and uh alex is going to mail that uh copy a signed copy of the book for you so yes. congratulations yeah. so exciting well okay. done congratulations Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Alex, for sharing your gorgeous art with us. Thank yeah, you I so much. That. Yeah, this is a super fun conversation. It's so good to chat about this and to share some of my process and uh, some of my experiences. Um, so thank you, everyone, for for tuning in and, and hanging out with us. Um, it's, it's uh, I always say this is like the great thing about zoom and this kind of online world is that we can we can kind of gather from all around the world wherever we are whatever time zone we're in um and share some time together so i really appreciate it uh thank you so much um yeah and thank you for the for the for the chat you're welcome yeah happy sketching everyone all right bye for now bye